Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Day. Hello, this is Gary, and this is episode 65 of the Kiwi Mana Buzz Speedkeeping Podcast. And we are located in the hills of the Waitaki Ranges in West Auckland, New Zealand. Our podcast is about beekeeping, gardening, and a bit of political issues about environmental issues. And some good news today from the New Zealand government. They're actually going to be looking into the impact of near nicotinoids and the effect on honeybees. So there's going to be a, a committee set up to investigate that. So here's hoping that we'll uh, get some good news from that. And this week we have author, urban beekeeper and bee evangelist Doug Pudi on the show. He's held from Sydney in Australia. And the show notes for this podcast are kiwimana.co.nz slash 65 or kiwimana.co.nz slash Doug. It's D-O-U-G. So sit back and have a listen to Doug Purdy. Well, thanks everyone for coming along today. And today we've got uh, Doug Purdy all the way from Australia. He's our first Australian guest. And Doug left a job in IT to save the bees in the last country in the world to be free of varroa mites. Doug is also the president of the Amateur Beekeeping Association of New South Wales and is the author of The Backyard Bees, A Guide for the Beginner Beekeeper. So we've given the audience a little overview, Doug, but take it from here and tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, well, I, I, um, I started beekeeping in 2009. And the reason I started was I was uh, selling honey up my local market for my local community association. And people kept asking me about honey and bees, and I didn't know any of the answers. So I started researching and was horrified to discover that bees were dying out all around the world because of, you know, Varroa and, and CCD. And... Um, and I thought, this is crazy. No one in Australia knows what I'm talking about. So I, that's how I became a beekeeper. And I sort of made it my mission to um, to bang on about bees to anybody that I can to try and um, help people understand how important bees are because because they're not threatened in Australia at the moment. Um, no one's really thinking about them. Yeah, that's unusual, isn't it? As a, do you think that's because of the varroa mites, you, do you think? Or, or why, why do you think they're not threatened there? Oh, look, because we don't have varroa, so, you know, we've got plenty of feral bees. I mean, most agriculture is, um, is pollinated by feral bees. So in the agricultural part of, of Australia, they don't really think about bees much. And in the urban areas, it's changed, but, you know, it, it, a few years ago, it was more that they were people, the councils were telling people how to get rid of them rather than how to save them. And definitely in the last 12 or 18 months, people are more aware of, of how important they are and are trying to save them, which is fantastic. You know, there's still a lot of people out there, including government people, that just don't get their head around how important they are. Oh, that's amazing. So, so the, you don't have a lot of pollination beekeeping going on? Look, it's, it's mainly for things like almonds, and, um, and you know, there's not a huge migratory um, pollination industry in Australia because of the amount of feral bees that we have. And most people in agriculture, you know, unless they're doing things like almonds, aren't really aware of how important bees are. Yeah, and when you, when you say feral bees, are, they, are these feral honey bees, or, or are these yeah. just the native ones? Yeah, no, the feral honey bees. So you know, oh. the European honey bee was bought here in about 1822, and it just took off. Yeah, and um, it heavily established itself, and it's been established throughout the bush since then. And uh, it's the feral honey bee that does you know a great deal of the pollination in Australia. Okay, oh, that sounds good. And so, do, do you miss working in IT? <laughs> No, not particularly. Um, you know, I, I, I seem to somehow wind IT into bees here and there. You know, I was actually just downstairs at the forum, a workshop, trying to build an electronic hive scale. So I, I seem to keep electronics in there somehow. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, because I, yeah, I, I actually work in IT as well, which is uh, something a lot of people don't know about me because I have a full-time job as well as, as doing what I do. So, yeah, I can I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which I, I and I guess I kind of do. I use my IT skills for doing the blog on the podcast, so it sort of still doesn't go away. So, yeah, that's right. It's funny how you, you seem to find skills, you know, from from what you do or might have done in the past, and weave those into whatever you're doing. So, you know, I've I've got a sort of strong internet background, and a lot of that's weaved into the applications I've built to help us manage our hive. Yeah, and you've also got a bit of a marketing background as well, haven't you? That's right, yeah. It was actually marketing IT that, that I came from, so oh, all of okay. that's been quite useful in marketing our product and what we do. Oh, that's fantastic. And so, so what, because you actually rent out hives and also keep hives, what sort of predominantly type of hive do you keep? Well, all, my, all our bees really are in um, Langstroth 10 frame beehives. And, uh, and we chose those 
for a number of reasons. First of all, I can go to the corner shop and buy one. Well, not the corner shop, but I can go to the, the local bee shop and buy one of those hives. And um, and the other designs just weren't available in Australia in any sort of quantity. And and that's important to what we do, that we can readily get equipment. Yeah, that's... that's and, yeah. Um, and, you know, 10 frame, they get a bit heavy, but uh, they're more stable. So a lot of our hives are on rooftops or in very windy areas. And because of the footprint of the 10 frame, it's not going to blow over readily. No, no. And so I've been reading your book. It's a fantastic book, by the way. So I'm really oh, enjoying it. Just there's there's only one bad comment about it about the manuka honey, but I'll have to talk to you about that later. <laughs> I thought you might pick that up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, and um, yeah, just so what do you what do you think urban bees do better than rural bees in Australia? Well, it's yeah, it's it's purely diet. Well, it's not purely diet. But diet's got a lot to do with it. Um, you know, in a lot of a lot of rural areas now, um, there's monocultures. And, you know, as we know, you've got to have mixed um, proteins and, and if you don't have a mixed food source, then you're not healthy. So I think that's got a lot to do with it. Um, also, you know, in urban areas, you've got forage all year round because people have planted all sorts of exotic plants that flower in the winter that wouldn't exist, you know, in, in a lot of country areas. And then thirdly, it's the whole heat island effect. So you've got all these buildings in concrete to keep the area warmer during winter, although at the moment we don't really need that because I think... I think the uh, temperatures are warming up anyway, but you have the heat island effect where it's warmer in, in the city areas. That means the um, bees don't have to work quite as hard to keep the hive warm during winter. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And we, we we find they often start earlier as well in the, in the rural in the urban yeah. areas, um, whereas the rural areas they're kind of just picking up now. So, no, yeah, well, I think good. a lot of that's to do with the temperature. You know, it's, it's not so much warmer in our cities that uh, I think it's it's a lot warmer as so they get started earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's certainly, like we see honey flows coming in during winter when it's warm um, from, from various exotics. It's really quite quite astounding how much honey they can make when, it, when it's warm. Yeah. And, and what sort of temperatures do you get around Sydney? Is it quite get hot? It's a hot city, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Look, I mean, it, well, as I was um, talking to you before who we started recording this, you know, we, yesterday was 35 in Sydney. Um, then overnight was 14, and it's going to be cold today, about 20. Yeah. Um, so we get sort of at the moment it's it's all over the place. But during winter we had extremely warm temperatures during winter, um, like really unseasonally warm. Where you it was shorts and t-shirts were. Yeah. Um, you know it was really quite amazing, and that that's unusual. It should be a lot colder than that. The biggest issue we've had actually is it's been very dry, so there's not a lot of rainfall, and of course without rain don't get good nectar flow. No, so no. That's been, been an issue for us as well in the last couple of years. Okay. And do, because it's so hot there, do, do you have mesh boards on your hives or, or any kind of ventilation? No, look, it's, in Australia, there's not a lot of people who use mesh floors. Um, and because we don't have varroa, then no one's doing a varroa count. So there's, it's mainly solid bottom boards. Yeah. And people don't really add a lot of extra ventilation on top. We've got hives that are in pretty exposed areas and, uh, and in full sun. And um, I've been experimenting with different sorts of lids, like stacking up. We use migratory lids. I mean, I've been stacking two of those lids on top of each other to, to provide an airspace. And then um, I've just tried, this, this summer I'm going to trial peaked over lids that go over the standard lid to give her an airspace and a bit more shade for the hives and see how they go. I mean, the bees have been fine, but I want to try and make it as, as comfortable for them as possible. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so, so what, what excites you about beekeeping, Doug? Oh, look, bees are fascinating. You know, I mean, if somebody had said to me a few years ago that I would sit there and look at bee, bees coming and going out of the beehive and be absolutely fascinated, I would have thought that they were nuts. But, um, but I love bees, and I, and I love watching what, what they're doing and where they've been and, and you know, wondering where they've been um, when you see odd-coloured pollens coming back. And then the whole idea of just interacting with them you know, each hive is different, and, and they seem to do things slightly differently. Unfortunately, they haven't read my book, so, um, so they <laughs> yeah. do things differently each time around, you know, just to challenge you. But managing those challenges is interesting. It's, it's a constant learning experience. Yeah, absolutely, and they, and, they, and they never tell you when they're going to swarm either, which a lot of our customers, <laughs> are, a lot of our customers have realised the last couple of days. They, they don't leave a message on your answer phone. No, if only they did, you know. I was, I was reading some research, some of them reckons they've developed a a system of listening to the sounds inside the beehive that can predict swarming. Yeah, and, um, we we had, we had a guy on here oh, a while back, um, a guy called James from Seattle that had a had a device that did that. It was a as an iPhone app. Yeah. Yeah, it, it just sounds it sounds very interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, and if if only it was that simple, you know, it would be yeah. great. <laughs> but, um, 
just how wonderful would it be to be able to duck out there when they've had a swarm. Yeah, if you, one thing that's happened this year which has been quite interesting is, is you know, I've gone and checked our hives, as you do, and, um, and you know, a couple of our hives have swarmed, most of them haven't. Um, and the ones that have swarmed, I've gone and opened the hives, you know, and as soon as I found out that they've swarmed, and witnessed sort of four or five queen catching at the same time. Wow. And, um, Prior to that, I've only ever witnessed a few queen catching, but this time around, every time, it's been been amazing. They've all the timing has been spot on with the, the queen catching the next day. But not just one queen cell, you know, two or three queen catching at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that beginners often fall into a trap is they think that if there's queen cells in the hive, they think they can crush them and stop the queen um, bees swarming. But you know, generally, when there's queen cells already, they, they've already decided to leave. You know what I mean? So That's gotta, right, yeah, there's not much you can do. All you can do is split the hive. Yeah, you've um, got to do something okay, drastic. Yeah. You can't just crush the queen cells, yeah. No, and, I mean, when, yeah. when I first you know, started beekeeping, we, we decided what we'd do is um, if we, if we uh, split hives, you know, if, if they had queen cells, we'd split them. Um, and we'd, we'd crush all but one queen cell. Yeah. Because um, we thought that would fix up any, any after swarms that might happen. And it's really interesting because the failure rate was, was huge. Yeah, uh, I don't know what the actual failure rate of queens are of being raised in queen cells, but it must be fairly high, which is why they make so many spares. Absolutely, I mean, there's so much can go on, and, and you know, on the on the queens' um, mating flights, they can get eaten by a bird or run over by a yeah. car or something. You know, there's lots of stuff can go on, can't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a, a very very risky. Um, I mean, bees are obviously pessimists because they they really uh, err on the on the side of caution. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm guessing that the city bees have even got more hazards to, to contend with. Well, that's right. You know, they do. I mean, we, there's a few hives that we have spread around Sydney that have, that have um, bird populations that just hang out beside the hive, just snacking on the odd forager coming back. You know, so it must raise the risk of one of those foragers being a queen. Um, <laughs> yeah. Dramatically. So, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we have a local kingfisher that, that regularly flies through our apiary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming with the mouth open. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's right. With a mouthful of, and at the end they're chomping on bees. So that's right. Yeah. But uh, it's it's all it's all nature, isn't it? Oh, look, absolutely. You know, I mean, and you know, swarming's natural too. You know, a, a lot of people get very um, concerned about swarming, and certainly the public gets concerned about swarming. But it is all part of what bees do. As long as they don't go into your wall, and a beekeeper comes along and collects them, that's a good thing. One of the problems we have in Australia is because. Because we don't have varroa, so the bees are populous, you know, the hives are strong. Um, it's just the number of swarms that we get sometimes, and it's very difficult to find beekeepers to take them. Um, yeah. Many. In the association, you know, we'll get a thousand phone calls during swarming season, and it's almost impossible to get enough beekeepers to go out there and collect them. Oh, okay. And do you have a lot of hobbyist beekeepers in Australia? Yeah, look, the numbers are interesting. Um, in New South Wales, for example, there's about 3,500 registered beekeepers, and most of them would be hobbyists. There's only a, you know, a few uh, professionals, and, and the number of professionals is dropping, not not increase of the, the pressures that they have at the moment. Yeah. Um, and the the, the the department reckons that of those um, those beekeepers, there's probably you know another another thirty percent that don't register. So it, it's well, I, when I crunch the numbers, I crunch the numbers and compared the, compared the New South Wales Association to the um, the British Beekeeping Association. Yeah, and the percentages actually work out about the same based on population. Oh, okay. So I, think we've got an, I think we've got an average number of beekeepers. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I think in New Zealand we've got about I think it's about just under five thousand beekeepers. Um, yeah, but the numbers the numbers are increasing. Mean, I'm sure you're finding the numbers are increasing, and they're, they're younger. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, traditionally here, or when I first got involved in the beekeeping associations, the numbers were were older, um, and they're typically you know fifty fifty or they're about a year old man um, whose kids at this time and he was trying to work out what to do with himself and he took up beekeeping. Yeah. And um, it, it seems to have changed now and it's a lot younger people that are interested. Certainly the courses that we do, there are a lot younger people. And a lot more women are interested, which is fantastic. Um, oh, absolutely. I think, I th- you know. yeah, I think women make the best beekeepers really, don't they? I yeah, think. absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, my business partner, Vicky, is um, a woman. Yeah, and um, and it's great because we work together very well, and it's good to have, you know, two perspectives on things. So we we think of things differently, and that works really really well. Yeah, absolutely. 
we're going to go back in time now, just to the time before you started beekeeping, Doug. And what's, what's the one thing you would advise yourself about beekeeping? The one thing... Oh, gee. That's a difficult question. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, what what one thing you wish wish you knew before you started beekeeping? Maybe you could rephrase it like that. Oh, look, I tell you what. I, I think probably if if I um if I understood not to be scared of bees, then I think that would have made life a lot easier because I was fairly terrified of bees when I first got involved in beekeeping. Oh, really? And my first ever my first ever beehive, unfortunately, was highly aggressive. Oh, okay. And so. My introduction to beekeeping was opening a beehive and having so many bees on my bee suit that I couldn't see the beehive. <laughs> and, um, and so, it, it, and, you know, and, and numerous failed requeening attempts on that hive. Yeah, yeah, that's... So, you know, it, I never really understood to take my gloves off because I don't wear gloves anymore, beekeeping. Um, I never really understood to take my gloves off and not to be quite as scared of bees um, for a little while after that because of the first experience. Yeah, and, that, and and being, I, I guess, being scared of them as well probably makes the bees more aggressive too, doesn't it? Well, you know, I don't know. I find it that um, wearing too much protective gear, you're you feel like you're isolated from the bees, which I think can make you a little bit rougher on the bees than you need to be. And um, certainly, you know, I haven't worn gloves now for a couple of years, unless unless you experience an angry hive and you have to put them on. Um, and I find it's a lot gentler working with the bees without gloves on and you get work done a lot quicker because you're a lot more dexterous and um, and I much prefer not wearing gloves um, working bee hives. Also it's good because if you've got a number of hives you can wash your hands between hives so you're not spreading the potential to spread ASB for example between bee hives isn't there because you're washing your hands whereas gloves make it much harder to clean them. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. Yeah, I think definitely when you don't have we're not wearing gloves all the time, you you are a lot be, easier to handle the bees. I think definitely, especially like picking up queens and things like that. Yeah, well, I mean, how can you do that with gloves on? I mean, I, I, I've got I, I think I've got um, fingers like pork sausages when I go to pick up queens anyway, because I always feel feel like I'm going to squash them. You know, so having gloves on and trying to do that would be just about impossible. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and. Uh, a, a good way to practice queen handling is, is pick up drones. Yeah, that's what, that's yeah. What, see, that's one of the things that's why it's good to have um, have a female business partner because Vicky, who has got lots of experience in handling queens. I usually let her mark all the queens. Yeah. Um, and she learnt uh, how to do that in um, in Kangaroo Island, and she always that's what we always teach people is to pick up drones and, and get used to handling drones because um, then you get a, a used to the feel of a bee, so you're not going to squash the queen. Yeah, absolutely. And can you, can you tell, I know, we know you've written a new book called uh, The uh, Backyard Bees, a guide for the beginner beekeeper. Can you tell us a bit about your book and what was your motivation for writing it? Well, look, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I never set out to write the book. Um, and uh, my, my mission in beekeeping really has been to educate people that we need bees and we need to look after them. And, um, and I still do a lot of that. I'm always talking to people about bees. And... What happened was I got approached to write the book and in thinking about the mission that I was trying to accomplish in educating people about bees, the book has become you know, a fantastic platform for doing that because although I, in the book I try and encourage everybody to become a beekeeper, you don't need to be a beekeeper, you just need to understand bees a little bit better and, um, and if, I, if I can get you know, someone to read the book and just understand bees a little bit better, then I've accomplished what I wanted to do, which is to educate people that bees need saving. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so writing the book was a really interesting exercise because it made you think about a whole lot of things that you do and, and try and cut. You know, when, you, when you're a beekeeper, you often get into routine and you do things in a certain way and it's just the way that you do it. And writing the book challenges you on that because you've got to explain why you do things in a certain way and, and, and let them make sense. Um, so it was quite interesting. It's, it's also been a bit polarising with people that, that don't, like some of the things that I've said in the book, but um, I guess that's beekeeping. You know, everybody's got a different opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think sometimes it's 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 hard to remember the stuff you you never knew. You know what I mean? Or you didn't you you just always do. I think that's very yeah. I know not you mean by that. Yeah, like you just you, you don't know why you do certain things, do you? No, that's right. And so, to, to, if you're writing a book about it, you've got to sort of justify your your, your position. Um, 
So that would been quite interesting to do that and to put down, you know, how to open a beehive and do an inspection. And um, just on a basic level, it, it means you've got to really think about your methodologies and why. Yeah. And uh, that was quite a good experience. No, I, well, I'm, I'm enjoying the book. I was a bit a bit shocked by your comment about Manuka honey being not very tasty, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just people's opinion, isn't it? So, a- uh, absolutely. It's, yeah. It's interesting, you know, and of course, be, being Australian, you know, we talk a lot about... Um, about leptospermum hummings, which are which are similar to, to manukas in a lot of ways, um, and I think what's fascinating about this medicinal honeys in general is that yeah, it's it, it's early days, and and I think the the uses for honey are really going to explode um, in the next few years when when people do a lot of scientific work and just realise how what a wonderful product it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we we just had um, Cliff Van Eaton on about his new book about manuka honey, so it's really it's a it's a powerful thing. And, um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the different products that are coming out of the beehives now um, are interesting, although I despair at some of them. Uh, always, yeah, there's, there's these beauty creams you can buy, certainly in Australia at the moment, that have got bee venom in them. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't agree with that. <laughs> no, of course not. You know, and I laugh. I call it bee tox. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's just those sort of products. It's like why? Um and also, it's like people that eat royal jelly. I'm sure it's great beef food, but I'm not sure that it's great great for um, for people. I just object to venom because I think you, you you're provoking the bee to get angry and and yeah. sting something. So you, you you're agitating an, uh, the bee to make someone's face look better. You know what I mean? I think you're exactly right. And they probably don't need their face to look better anyway. No, so I, I, no. So I, I often I often talk to people about some of the bee products that you can buy and and why I think they're well for me they're not ethically. Produce. No, um, but then I love bees, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, I, I come from a point of loving loving cr- the, the bees, so um, so you know the decisions I make are based on that rather than perhaps you know, their commercial decisions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I've seen I've seen um, videos of them getting the venom off, and it's not pretty. Yeah. No, no, that's right. They electric shock the bees, don't they? So. Basically, yeah, and they, you know, they, they people go, oh, it doesn't kill them, but you know, it's, it still agitates them. And I think, well, you know, is it okay to poke an animal and in, in the side until it spits at you? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. You know, if you came <laughs> along and poked me with a stick every every couple of days, I'd get angry. Well, exactly. You know, it's it's like you know, putting like an electric um electric floor on your front door, and then every yeah. time you come home, you get electrocuted and you get angry. Is that you know, how does that feel? <laughs> that's right, that's right. We should try it out. That's what we should do. We should try that. Yeah, we should. We should try and find these people that make the stuff and put make electrify their uh, front doors or something just for a laugh. Well, I'll just electrify the shelf in, in the um, in the shop that has the big venom products. <laughs> so every time you pick up the jar, you get an electric shock and just see how. Yeah, how does that feel? Does that make you angry? <laughs> oh no, that's that's all good. And so, so what do you, what do you think's the biggest issue facing you big hipping in in in, uh, in Australia at the moment? Or in Sydney. Look, at the moment, it's the drought. Yeah, I, I saw some some media yesterday that was saying that the um, commercial guys are looking at a fifty percent less honey harvest this year, and um, and that's mainly to do with drought because we've still got extensive drought in the country. And then last year they had the same problem, so we've got a lot of imported honey in Australia at the moment coming across from places like China, um, trying to fill up the gap. Yeah, and um, you know the wholesale price has gone up, um, and the the honey shelves in the supermarkets are smaller than they used to be, because this isn't the product. So it's a big challenge, and um, and you know for the poor commercial beekeeper who's got you know all sorts of equipment like this, um, it's a challenge too because they're just not getting the product that they were expecting. On on top of that, the National Parks and Wildlife Service um, are looking at restricting beekeepers' access to the national parks. Oh. Um, What's their, motiv- major issue. What's their motivation for that? Look, I don't really know. There's, there, in Australia, um, the, the European honeybee is declared, um, I can't remember the right term, but it's basically a pest um, in its unmanaged form. Yeah. And a lot of the people involved in environmental sciences confuse managed and unmanaged bees and, um, and therefore think that bees and beehives are a problem. I mean, there was a situation here in New South Wales where a bee club that had been in existence for a, for a long time up in up in Karingai, um, I think they've been there for 30 years, I think, something like that, um, where suddenly the council required an environmental impact statement for their four beehives. 
and it was all based on this this, um, this managed and unmanaged beehive confusion and the fact that, that unmanaged beehives were considered to be a, a pest. And um, in the end, even though you know someone from from the government department wrote to the council, they still insisted on um, on these guys not being able to have beehives there, and they subsequently moved to a different council. So th- th- there's a lot of pressures being placed on beekeepers around access to national parks and and places like that, which is is, is a big concern. Yeah, that that is shocking, eh? Considering you know considering the worldwide decline in bees, you think they'd be trying to encourage as many people as they can, wouldn't you? Well, uh, this is the problem is we don't have those issues here in Australia. So because yeah. we don't have the issues, people aren't thinking of it. You know, I, I interact with one of the big councils here in Sydney, a fair bit, City of Sydney, and um, and you know, they still use herbicides in all their parts, and they spray it at eight o'clock in the morning, and then put all signs up warning people that they shouldn't get herbicide on themselves. Yeah, and um, you know, it's like. <sighs> I understand the need to keep weeds down, but spray your herbicide late in the afternoon or something. You know, it's just, and when I talk to them about it, they keep on telling me how the herbicide's safe and it's it's not going to affect anybody, but including bees. But I'm not yeah. sure about that. No. Yeah, I mean, I mean um, do they spray them when they're still flowering? Yes. Yeah, that's not good, is it? Not good the, yeah, also, they're, they're very big on um, on... Uh, revitalizing areas, but they revitalize them with plants that aren't necessarily flowering. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, where, where other parts of the world, like I saw yesterday that Seattle is spending uh, a fortune on a, on a big forest, basically food forest in the inner city areas. Um, here we tend to replant things in a very sort of non-habitat way where there's no habitat for things and plant trees that don't have flowers. And those things worry me because we're just reducing the habitat that's available. That's it, and the thing is, the good the thing about weeds, a lot of them are actually really good food sources for pollinators. They, they should... Oh, exactly. It's not, it's not just bees; it's all the other insects that, that benefit as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, like you know, a, a nicely manicured lawn is just like a desert, isn't it, for a pollinator? Oh, absolutely. You know, and mm. for, for most insects, it is. And um, and so I, I usually get a fairly violent response when I tweet something about an issue like that, where they, they're aghast that I'd be saying that they're not looking after the environment. But I, I think that at the moment the you know, organisations aren't really understanding the issues. They're not, they can't be looking at what's going on overseas and they're just assuming that these are, are an issue rather than a good thing. Yeah, that's it's, it's shocking, eh? Yeah, well, you, you keep tweeting there, uh, Doug. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm not going away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keep, <laughs> you keep stirring them up. You've got to... No, that's that's crazy. We're all holding our fingers here for you, man, because that we you don't, never get for our might. So I'm just, oh, you know, it'd be yeah, awesome. Well, but I mean, look, you know, it, may, I think it's inevitable. I think know, it we'll, will. We'll get it. it probably will. It, it just depends how you buy security. And I think don't they have it in? Um, is it Papua New Guinea's got it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's within. I think it's within these flight distance of Sydney. So Papua New Guinea's got both both throwers. They've got the Jacob Sarney as well as the Destructor. Yeah. Um, and we've got Apis Serana up in Queensland, of course. Yeah. Um, and they've, they've actually found it in Australia a couple of times on ships. That's right. So, yeah. You know, if, it, it will, I think it's inevitable that it will get here, which is you know, quite upsetting. Um, but, of course, the government's are reducing biosecurity funding, but it's not increasing it. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, sooner or later it will happen, unfortunately. Yeah, that's that's going to be sad. Because you, you've, you've got hive beetles as well, eh? Are they, are they a big problem for you? Look, I don't think so. A lot of people talk about how hive beetles is you know, the worst thing ever. But um, we don't have that much problem with hive beetles. I, I believe it's more of a problem if you've got a hive that doesn't have large numbers in it. It's all yeah. about the, sort of the, the bee to comb ratio. If you've got enough bees to look after the comb, then hive beetle won't be a problem. It's only if the hive weakens okay. um, that the hive beetle can get a, a foothold. That, the, the exception to that rule is actually in, in harvesting honey. Yeah. Because, you know, you've got to extract the honey quickly. You can't leave frames sitting around because the hive beetle may have laid eggs on them. Yes, it um, kind of sounds like the same deal with wax moths. You know, if you've got a strong hive, they won't have a chance. Yeah, that's right. I think, look, I think that's the case. And, and, I mean, I'm sure there's there's a different parts of the world where maybe there's a high humidity that they're more of a problem. But here in, in... in Sydney, anyway, we don't really have any hives that have a problem. And we, some of our hives have got a, a fairly high hive beetle number, and we, but we don't use beetle traps because I, and it's another thing to deal with when you open a hive. Yeah, yeah. And 
you know, and we don't really have issues with, with losing hives to hive feed unless unless they're weakened. Oh, absolutely. And I was talking to um, Tyson in Los Angeles, and they, they've got a lot of hives on roofs as well. And and so they yep. they find because because the, the actual beetle can't burrow under the ground because it's on a solid roof that they don't have any much problems with them. So that may that yeah, may but, be a factor yeah. in your case too. Yeah, look, we've got a mix. So we've got about about fifty percent hives on hard surfaces and fifty percent on places where there is space for the beetle to to burrow. Yeah. Um, and, and really, we don't have a problem. Yeah, oh, that's but, good. Um, you know, I, I'm really with interest uh, to concerns in the UK because of the hive beetles now in Italy, and um, and all the beekeepers in the UK are terrified that the hive beetles are going to arrive in the UK. And I think it'll be very interesting because it's so cold over there that I don't know whether the hive beetle will make that much impact. Yeah, 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 true. Yeah, because it, it's only, I think even in, the, in America, it's only in the lower states, isn't it? It's not the, like the colder northern states don't have as much of a problem. No, because the beetle definitely seems to go dormant during the um, during the cold part of the year. Yeah. And um, and for us, that's, you know, below below 20. <laughs> Yeah, and so twenty degrees is probably a balmy day if you're in the UK. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any other pests in Australia that you have to deal with that, that affect your bees? Uh, look, not really. Hive beetle would be the biggest issue. I mean, so for us, American sow brood and and hive beetle would be the two um, big issues that we have. And, and American sow brood has, has sort of raised its head a bit because of the the um, conditions. So last yeah, last year there wasn't a lot of nectar around for a while. And I think a lot of feral hives have suffered because of that. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and maybe there's been hives out there that have been a bit iffy because they've had AFB and uh, have died out and therefore it's spread a bit more. So there's been a, a few spots popping up around um, around the place that have had AFB. And that's probably probably the biggest risk we have is AFB. And do you guys treat for AFB or what do you do in Australia? Um, the protocols in Australia are if you've got AFB, you destroy the beehive. Yeah, um, and you either or destroy the bees anyway in the comb and and burn it, and you can irradiate the equipment. Oh, okay. So yeah, that that's that's basically the the protocol. Um, so you either you either burn the whole lot and bury it thirty centimeters under the ground, or you you sort of destroy the bees and and the comb and then irradiate the rest, um, and then reuse it. Yeah, that's similar here. We 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 don't irradiate stuff, but we um we. We sort of have things with paraffin wax dippers. We can dip dip boxes okay. in there, yeah. but generally most yeah, people well, just then, burn them. Yeah, yeah, you can use that too, but it's not legal to use that in Australia. So that the legal requirement is that you irradiate or burn. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. But um, yeah, paraffin wax dipping, of course, it has the same effect, but it's not a legal way of dealing with it. Oh, okay. And, and so, what, what do you think is the biggest mistake you see a lot of um, beginning beekeepers making? Um, I oh, look at the classic one is hive placement. Yeah, so, so you know it's always uh, they always pick the wrong spot to put the beehive, and and then realise that it's you know you've got to move it across the most inconvenient part of your yard to get it to the right place. Yeah, um, yeah. Always has to be the way, um, and I, I think not inspecting the brood box. You know, a lot of people are terrified of squashing the queen, so they just don't go into the brood box. So important to inspect the brood to know what's going on. You know, obviously, it's not thing you do every time you open a beehive, but but you know, to be able to open, inspect the brood, and make sure that you've got a queen and that she's healthy is important. Absolutely, and a lot of beekeepers are terrified of doing that. Oh, okay, I've never heard that one before. So that that yeah, that's definitely the most important thing because you've got to make sure that that the queen is actually a viable queen, and your hive's not going to pass, you know, die. So yeah, of very course. important. You know, and, and and in your swarm season, how how do you know if you don't inspect the brood? Yeah, exactly. Um, and the other thing to look for is, you know, yeah, as you said before, AFB. You've got to make sure that the hive's not got AFB. So it's very important to pick that yeah. up quickly. Yeah, we've got a lot of a lot of beekeepers that that practice what they call natural beekeeping in Australia. Yeah, and um, and a fair number of of them don't like inspecting the brood because they they feel like it's interfering with, with sort of how the hive is operating. So I always try and educate people, no matter what method of beekeeping they're practicing that it's really your responsibility as a steward of those bees to check and make sure that they're healthy well i guess i guess it's easy to be a natural beekeeper in australia isn't it because you're not treating for varroa mites and stuff <laughs> well, well that's yeah. right yeah of course 
Yeah, so, exactly. You, know, you, you can you can keep these in a shoebox here, and they'll be quite fine. But um, although they'll, out, they'll outgrow the shoebox pretty quickly. You know, but, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. It, if you don't have varroa, it makes all of those things a lot e- a lot easier. A lot um, easier, yeah. Yeah, it's like you know, like the people, like in the nineteen fifties, everyone was a natural beekeeper, weren't they? <laughs> That's right. Mm. Well, so the problem you've got is that is a lot of um, people, you know, and, and the, the 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 things that I hear about what goes on in the sort of commercial world in Australia, I don't know how accurate it is, but I hear a lot of stories of, of um, commercial beekeepers using antibiotics to keep their bees healthy. Yeah. And, um, you know, and that, that concerns me a little bit because that's not a good way of dealing with bees. And how will they cope with varroa when that happens? They, they, if they're using antibiotics now, it's just, um, yeah, yeah I'm absolutely. I, I know, I know that's a big thing in, a, in America. They do that. They, um, they treat AFB with, um, antibiotics. So, yeah, and yeah. all it's going to do is mask it. It's not going to fix it. Well, no. And, and, and the other thing is that they, they're actually breeding, um, AFB spores that will, they AFB strains that are actually resistant to antibiotics. Yeah, well, of course. Oh, yeah. That's the next thing they do. So that's yeah. not good. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And and so so what's what's your uh, beekeeping plans for the next season or well, this coming season? You're, you're you're coming into spring as well, aren't you? Well, you're that's in right. Yeah. yeah. So we, we're increasing the number of hives that we manage, and I guess trying to trying to find the the, the right number. Yeah. Um, because it's, now that I'm doing this full time, um, I've got more time to, to manage hives. Although I must say, I, must, I think I spend half my day doing paperwork. Um, but <laughs> yeah. what, what we're trying to do is increase the number of hives and increase our education. Um, and another thing that we're looking at doing is actually opening a, a shop for beekeeping closer into the city to, to help people that are in the city um, acquire the equipment they need. Because at the moment, the, the closest shops are a fair way out of town. Oh, okay. Sounds a good idea. And so, are you actively looking for more clients to have rent hives from you? Yeah, we are. I mean, the way we do that has changed. When yeah. we first started, we were choosing any site that would say yes, and we, we realised that we were driving from you know one end of town to the other, and parking in Sydney in traffic is, is quite a problem, and um, and that was negating the benefit of what we were trying to do. So. Um, so what we do now is we're quite selective in the sort of sites that we will choose and try and choose sites where we can put a number of hives and then there's less less impact of us driving around to service them. No, that's a good idea. And, and if people want to get in touch with you about that, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, through the website's the best way. So, you know, the organisation is the, the Urban Beehive. Yep, okay. Um, we'll, we'll include that in the they, show notes, yeah. yeah. If they Google the Urban Beehive, um, they'll find us and there's... You know, there's contact details there and also a registration form if they um, are interested in us hosting sites on their property. Oh, fantastic. And, and you've got you've got a um, a blog as well, have you? The Bee, Bee Evangelist? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, I've got a, a blog called The Bee Evangelist. Although I have to say, I've, I've, it's been sadly neglected, <laughs> neglected recently because because of just the, the book and everything else. And I you know, have various social media under The Bee Evangelist name or, or my name, Doug Purdy. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. Cool. Oh, well, thanks so much for coming along, Doug. It's been fantastic. Really enjoyed talking to you. And, um, oh, look, any time. I mean, it's really, really good to, to share knowledge. That's that's why I started beekeeping is to share what's going on. So it's really interesting to hear what's going on in other parts of the world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we need to, need to get some more uh, urban beekeepers in Australia, don't we? That's absolutely. Yeah, so thanks, everyone, for listening. And the show notes for this one will be Kiwimana co.nz slash Doug. We'll get all those links to uh, Doug's blog and to his business and also a link to his uh, fantastic book. So, yeah, we'll see you next time.